so as I said, we're delighted to, to have Eileen O'Sullivan here with us this evening and we have her show on in the Solstice uh, Cafe foyer here and it is on from, it's open Monday to Saturday from 10 until 4pm until Friday the 18th of June if you haven't had the opportunity to come in and see it. Um, but for those of you that are further, further away than me this evening, I do have the images to show you um, as we go through the talk, if that's okay. Um, so Eileen, you're really welcome. Thanks a million again. Thanks so much. Uh, mm -hmm. Delighted to be here and uh, it's lovely to see so many familiar faces, some artists from me, then some friends and family and it's really lovely. Um, I suppose not, um, not get, getting to have that regular uh, art opening, you miss chatting to people um, in the art community so this is a really lovely opportunity for me to chat to people about my work and uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have even if it's the classic um, I don't know what that is. What is it? <laughs> question. There's Sorry. no question. <laughs> Sorry, Eileen, thanks a million. Um, well, would you like to begin by maybe telling us a little bit about yourself? Um, yeah, no problem. Um, I'm, I'm um, from Ashburn, County Mead, so that's my connection to the Salsa's Art uh, Gallery. Um, I went to school in Ashburn Community School. I see Miss Mara is on uh, on Zoom, um, uh, nice to see you. Um, and then I studied painting at the National College of Art and Design. Um, and I've been working as an artist since I graduated in 2015. And um, I currently have a studio in, um, in Dublin, in uh, just in beside Belvedere College off Parnell Square. And I share the studio with, um, another artist Marion Dolph and a uh, fashion designer Natalie B. Coleman and um, so that's a nice place to go in and work every day. Um, I do a bit of work with the National Gallery doing facilitating art with uh, mainly families and children so that's a nice um, complimentary job to my practice and um, yeah I've been I've just finished a course in Trinity um, it's on cultural and creative entrepreneurship and um, still uh, on the Terps correspondence course as well. So um, that's where I'm at at the moment. Um, Great. You might tell us a little bit about the Terps correspondence course at the end. Um, I'm curious to hear about that as well. No um, and I'm sure you'll have one or two questions as well about it. So. That's great. Thank you. And this artwork, um, the five five pieces, four pieces that you have here in, in the foyer, they were all created in the last two years during the pandemic. Can you tell me how that affected your work or did it change it dramatically or how did you respond or cope, um, you know, under those, that situation? Did you have access to your studio, etc.? cetera? Um, I suppose um, the pandemic has been quite difficult in terms of, um, even just keeping my energy up, as I'm sure most people have had the same experience, um, to keep motivated and to keep um, inspired, I suppose, to be creative. Um, the Especially the curtain piece, uh, the big curtain piece, I originally um, started to construct that piece um, for an exhibition that was to take place in Dublin with 10 other Irish artists and that was cancelled due to COVID so that was a, a, a blow and um, it was a piece that it's it's so large that it didn't have um, you know it was hard to find a place to hang it so being able to hang it in the solstice was a brilliant opportunity especially because that wall is so uh, can take can take such a large work so that was a really exciting opportunity I, I did think that I was going to hang that piece in December and um, so I kind of had a rush over Christmas to, to get the piece finished and um, then sure we went into another lockdown then after Christmas and then um, hanging the piece in um, April um, was uh, very exciting 
but then sure you don't get the opportunity to chat about the work with other people at an opening or even just visiting with friends is a bit more limited because people have been more careful and um, in terms of my own work um I did for a while do some works uh change, kind of change material I'd normally have lots of canvases on the go at the same time in the studio but when I was during the pandemic I started to work uh on paper and um, just at home at the kitchen table and um, so I suppose that changed it a bit and then did even just did you mind did you mind that you had to do that or was it just kind of a a progression or you know the way sometimes when you have to change tack it's it can be off-putting or it can be inspiring um i definitely found it difficult uh to find a new routine when the pandemic hit i i found it difficult to divide home life and work life i spent a lot of time on the computer and that and that's not really I'm I'm a people person, so I get energized by other people. So I found it difficult to kind of I did find it difficult. It wasn't easy to adapt. Um but um even working on paper, I think that has served me in the long run because it's kind of changed how I've thought about the materials or even has given me um um i've kind of started planning paintings more rather than just working as i go i've started to plan them out more even i'm working on a series at the moment um and i've done a lot of work on paper before i get to the canvas so i'm curious to see how that will so it's almost as if they're less spontaneous or yeah. more thought does more thought go into them you say in planning possibly yeah but then maybe you're maybe not as many happy accidents will happen because they're more rigid than they would have been in the studio but i don't know it might it might go ahead to soft see how it pans out when i it'd be interesting to come back in a year or two and 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 share how it progressed i think yeah to see the difference yeah, yeah. and then sorry i'm just admitting and then speaking about then your creative process, so you, you were saying there that you kind of you went and started working a lot more on paper and planning. You do a lot of photography and compositional planning um, with your artwork. And one thing that I found fascinating when we were we were chatting about having your work here was your use of visual notebooks. Um, I know when I went to NCAD, it was all the physical notebook. We didn't use technology as much. Um, and I was fascinated by that. And I'm actually going to share my screen with everybody because I have um, a screenshot of your... So this is, is from one of your um, visual notebooks that you shared with me, so thank you very much. So would you like to talk about that process and how, how you use a combination of drawing and technology um, you know, in your in your process of gathering thoughts and information for your work. Yeah, of course. Um, when I was in first year in college, um, we were often taught to kind of uh, make worksheets or notebooks that explain your ideas and help you to develop them. Um, I found that pinning down ideas in a notebook uh, was almost when it, as soon as I put an idea in a notebook I felt like it it was dead because I wouldn't really take it out and use it again so I started to print off all of my source images and I used to have them in the studio so that I could um, you know, pick five images that I think might um, work together for a composition and use them for a while, but then they might change and uh, shuffle and be used again in another combination. So they were more alive than like sticking them down into a notebook. Um, but um, printing things out is very expensive. So I think 
because of that that's why I started using the digital notebooks more and um, I do find it more satisfying to have things in front of me in a physical sense so I can work with them but the digital notebooks um, like even when I was making the works for this show I um, would have an idea of what I want to make and um, all these uh, pieces that I've encountered on my day to day or things I've made in the studio they're all in my in my head already but when if I can collect them into one space um, it helps me to process them a bit easier so say like this notebook this little clip of my notebook um, this um, you can see um, up the top there's like um, a few different images of um, of a curtain piece that I made in 2018 and that piece I was kind of playing around with the idea of you know if I if I manipulate the canvas how does that affect the image or um, so I would have taken like lots of photographs and then um, they're there in some way but then how do they interact with um, there's that, that mirror piece that was an exhibition I went to see in Ima by um, an Iranian artist um, her name is Shah Rowdy I think her name is and um, you know that's another reference that I have in my mind that could influence me um, the, the image of the window is from uh, my friend's house um, I went up to Dundalk to work with her for a week at her studio or the the piece um the piece beside the window that's um uh that was one of the first pieces that I started to like draw curtains and then I was playing with it around the studio putting it in different contexts taking pictures of it um, and that helps me to um see how I want to go forward um, so I suppose it's it just putting all those things together helps me see how I want to move forward so the, these this visual notebook was for the big curtain piece so I can see that like from that then I can see that I want to I can group my priorities so I knew when I was making it that I wanted it to be really big because I had lots of images of um, say like uh, fences or walls of colour that would just gave like a big impact when you when you saw them or artists like um, uh, Sally um, what's her name Sally uh, I think it's Garbon she has a, a Aboriginal name I find it hard to remember um, when I saw her work I saw it in 2016 that really influenced me because I remember going into the gallery and uh, like turning the corner going in to the door and she just had such amazing colour um, on a huge scale so that influenced me to want to make a similar painting that like impacts the viewer when they stand beside it that it's really big and um, the right. color is kind of overwhelming. Um, yeah. So I suppose yeah, just uh, the visual notebooks is just a way to collect all those references for myself. No one else really ever sees them, but it can help me to filter through what way I want to work it because there's endless possibilities of what way you can make art. I was wondering that actually when you shared the link with me, if if they were something because I think notebooks are very personal whether di they're digital or physical and I, yeah I was I'm glad you said that because I was curious and that's why I asked your permission to show this this evening because yeah. I wasn't sure if um if you should you know some artists don't um because it's a thought it's like you're looking in your head sometimes I um remember going to a talk by Diana Copperwhite a painter who I admire a lot she's an Irish painter and she said that she's actually a very shy person mm. that she finds it very difficult to speak about her work and she overcame that by creating little publications that then she could 
give to people and then walk away so that she didn't have to explain the work to them there might be a little essay in it or something like that that would um ex you know explain her work and i would empathize with that a lot not in the sense that i'm don't think i'm a shy person but i do find it difficult to express um verbally all the things that i want to say about my work or what it means to me i often think when i speak about my work i simplify it down a lot um, so I suppose sharing this little visual notebook helps me to express that there is more behind it than maybe I might say in words. I think we're I, I think we're all like that yeah and I think we'll come back to the curtain I have some uh, visual images of the the curtain um, towards the end and we can come back to that as well as well because it is referenced quite a bit here in, in this snapshot but um i'm going to to move on to this the painting actually that's behind me um if it will let me do that <laughs> um, i'm just going to stop for a minute and bring it up again always a technical hitch no likes that one here we go so this piece returned to the first layer, as I said, which you, you can, can people, no, I'm looking at that on my own, am I? I am, sorry. Yeah. So this piece here, I suppose I will be more familiar with this type of work from you um, in the past where you use these gestural marks and these carefully, carefully built up layers of, of paint and um, you seem to use blocks of colour to give that illusion of, of space and, um, you know, kind of taking the eye or taking the viewer on a journey um, of, of what is a, a flat canvas, but it also almost becomes three dimensional in your use of layering. Um, and you, you know, you're bringing the eye through these multi layers of the composition. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that, um, that technique or that process that you use? Um, I suppose with this painting, um, the title refers to the process and that's kind of what I like, the way I like to name my paintings. Mostly I'll, I'll often just reference what I've done because painting for me is an action rather than um, rather than a way to, you know, I'm, I'm not making like a poster for an idea, a, a physical act, a, a doing, a, a craft kind of process mm -hmm. and, and return to the first layer. So this painting, I started off um, working from an image of a side of a building that I saw in Melbourne in 2016. And I took the photograph because um, I just thought it was very beautiful. Um, I thought it was very beautiful color composition um, that I would often just collect things that I, see in my environment and enjoy and um, so it was a, a fence uh, the slide a pink wall and then there was lots of like rusty things in the foreground and um, so that was the kind of the first layer and then I built up other images collaging things on on top of that and at one stage there was like a bike in this painting there was um like a, a surf like kind of an, an ellipse that um it was you could almost like climb into a sw swimming pool in it and it got like really dark and um there was just so much going on and um there's a painter who i really like her name is um amy Silmans, and she talks about how like she'll often kind of like turn her canvas upside down and uh, paint over it again and you, she often uh, shows people the process of like how a painting comes to be and it's an active process and there's no like right or wrong way to do it and um, it's like you just keep going until you kind of feel that it's finished and um, for me it's 
um, when even say when I'm walking down the street and you know um, you know when they have a shop that they're being refurbished and they've like wiped a white chalky paint on the windows like that to me is just a beautiful painting so that's the kind of thing that I think about when I'm trying to make something that is going to be on a wall for people to look at it's like those kind of qualities the material qualities that I want to include so when this painting got like really chaotic and had like a bike and a swimming pool and loads of imagery in it I obliterated them back to the colors that were first there when I first painted those that scene that I started with from Melbourne and kind of obliterated it back kind of thinking that I'd probably put something on top again but when it sat in the studio then I just really enjoyed the painting as it is now so it the point where I stop or when it's finished is kind of when it gets to a point where it has become something that I didn't know it was going to be before I started and it surprises me in some way um, and is it important to you you say I mean looking we're all looking at this we would have no idea that there are other elements such as a bike etc in this painting is it important to you that we know that or does is it relevant anymore because they're not visible um, I suppose the thing that it's not relevant to know what was there but I I do think that the process is very important for me to express uh, when someone asks me to explain a painting I'll mo uh, most often just go through what I did to be like oh I started with pink then I put on these marks then I went here and it's kind of like you go on this little journey with me because that's all I can say about the painting maybe through saying what I what I've done I'll uh, leak information about my thoughts Kind of saying like, well, I kind of wanted it to feel like this, or I wanted to create a space that felt a bit more this or that. Um, I had a I had a tutor when I was in Antwerp, and he used to um, he used to ask us. He was like, if I walked across the painting, if it, the painting was a surface, and I walked across it would I fall down at this point or would I be able to jump across? And um, that's something that I think about a lot when I'm painting, even say like the pink part, like if you started walking over at the green, then you might be able to jump onto the orange, but the pink part will probably fall further back. And it's, those things that I'm interested in and how do you create space but still give say the blue enough room to be like blue and fun and not be mushed up with another brown or they're the kind of things that I think about when I'm making a painting. Yeah, when you say that and have, I've had the privilege of, of knowing your work for a while that that makes perfect sense if you could walk across it what would you encounter I suppose um, and I can see that. And, I, and, and on that, I'm going to see, we're going to move on to the next two paintings. And these, and I'll show you the other one in a moment. So this is, uh, the work is in, in the underlayer. And again, you've referred to that layering in the title. Um, but yet, this is more an observational um, composition as opposed to, to the abstract. Um, although the next one then, uh, Veiled and Decorated, which the, the exhibition is, is called, does have that layering element and it makes it certainly makes me curious is this one painting is this two or three painted on top of it and um, you know so you're creating that sense of of mystery and um, so what was your intention behind these two then in comparison to to the one behind me the the first one we just talked about um so i suppose it's that thing of uh drawing the viewer's attention to paint as a material, I if I feel like if I wanted to uh, express um, an interest in the subject matter, photography might be a more appropriate um, medium to use. 
Um, I often think that it doesn't really matter what I paint. It's more the um, it's more just observing the potential in an image. So when I so the first painting that you showed there, um, that uh, painting had uh, two other versions underneath it. Um, and um, it got to a stage, there was, so none of that, um, none of that image of the house was on that painting. It was uh, very murky and dark and you couldn't really see what was going on in the other paintings because I had covered over a painting with that, that green you see down the bottom. And then through working on the on the paper, like I said, that I had during lockdown, I was doing lots of um, like drawing and lots of painting. I uh, painted this image that I took from a photograph. It's from the back of the garage at my mom's house. And um, I took the photograph because the light was really pleasing. And um, that's what drew me to take the photograph in the first place and um, that just the way the light was hitting the garage and um, then I had like drawn that image over and over again and um, painted it on paper um, and because I had observed that image so many times what then when I saw the green dark murky canvas I had in the studio I was like right that's perfect for that. If I put that um, drawing or painting that I've done on paper onto this canvas, the way that um, that those marks and that green murkiness is already on that canvas, that will make the house kind of sing because you get that like darkness in the green and then I can make the, um, the house really like flat and bright so it's kind of chasing the material qualities that keeps me most interested um, and these are all, sorry, I forgot to ask, these are all oils are they yeah they're all oil paints so it's really the material that keeps me excited and <laughs> motivates me to try and make marks that I think are um, alive or interesting I also love or with the other painting then that was a photograph that I took of um just plants in someone's window and um I it's a it's a really lovely photograph so much so that my friend uh, in the studio was like can I draw that because mm. <laughs> she really liked it as well and I was yeah. like no I want to make a painting of it so <laughs> It's kind of an uncomfortable thing to just to just paint from the photograph. Um, what do you mean by that? What uncomfortable makes you feel? Yeah, uncomfortable? makes me uncomfortable. I, um, I and I think it has a lot to do with my mood. So if I'm if I'm feeling like calm and confident, I'll have no problem about painting something very direct. Whereas when I made this painting, I was in my head more kind of thinking, thinking more. And I think that's vi visible in how chaotic this painting is. And there's lots of layers over one another and um, kind of thinking about pattern a lot or thinking about what, where your eye sits when you look at the painting. Maybe you might go in and look at the kind of smaller image in the, um, center left of the composition or maybe it might be drawn to the um, diamond shapes at the top or it could be the, the the green and the orange and how they kind of sit together um, or that thing again like if you walk across the canvas with which part do you, can you walk on and which part is further away they're all the 
things that I think about when I'm making a work. Yeah, and this is, I must say, this, because people won't know if they're just viewing this on the screen, but this is the smallest piece that you have in the show. And it seems to me to be um, the, the one with the most, not activity, but the most subject matter in it, I think, and the most, near, almost the most layering visible in it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you. So I think we'll move on. Um, you sent me a lovely quote when we were, were planning this and you were saying that um, familiar motifs interest you as relics of experience. Um, and for example, and then we'll move on to your curtain piece. So the curtain uh, implies privacy of a home, the public, uh, publicity or yeah, publicity of the stage and also the deceptive nature of painting and photography. Um, so you, maybe we'll start, would you describe this piece, the scale, um, I know you mentioned it briefly talking about your visual notebooks, but it's a really impactful piece um, here on the wall. So maybe you'd share with people, um, as I said, how, how large it is and then how, how it came about. Um, so this piece um, on the wall is about uh, four metres long by um, two meters high and um the canvas itself when like stretched out when it's not raveled it's 10 meters long so it's been it was a very large piece of canvas to work on um i took um my main inspiration for this piece uh from an artist called beatrice gonzalez who um, worked with, um, she worked with a lot of interior objects. Uh, so she had like a bed, a dressing table, a curtain, and uh, she would make paintings on those objects. And I think that that's very interesting because um, say even the curtain um, is something that we encounter all the time. And I think when there's a um, element of something being familiar to us, mm -hmm. it's easier to access. So if you're more familiar with, you know, we encounter curtains and chairs and dressing tables all the time. So that's not something that we're quite uh, intimidated by or afraid of. Um, whereas maybe if I made some kind of, I don't know, like big spiky metal uh, sculpture that I painted on, that maybe that would be something that you'd have to think about how you were going to interact with it. Whereas um, a curtain is something that we know what it is and, you know, it's very everyday. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I started to research, like, what is a curtain? What... Like, how do I want to go about that? And how do I want to include a curtain as a um, as an object in my work? All those kind of things of like privacy or um, pu public, like that's something that is connected to the curtain as an object or the, the stage, the curtain, um, in the theatre, that the Aris in in Hamlet, or the um, you know, even if you like veil the sun, sometimes that makes you able to to see something even clearer. If you're blocking the sun out, you can see what you're looking at clearer. So those kind of things, and then it also has movement in it. It's um, you know, canvases what uh, paintings are made up of so all of those things kind of come into play when you're thinking about making a piece like this um and this is the only piece you have in the show as well with figures it's figurative um, and how did that come about because you've gone from the piece behind me here which is very abstract to uh, the other two paintings that are more that have you know, have visible subjects in them. Um, and then to this, which is, it, it's almost as if it's a different person created it. Um, and so why the figures, why the people? 
Um, I had uh, the last um, solo show I had in 2018, I hung the show and when I walked into the room, I was taken aback by how many figures were looking at me <laughs> and how many faces there were. Um, and after that, I kind of thought to myself, okay, I'm going to take a step back from including figures in my work so that I can assess what does it mean to put a figure in a work and how do how does that af affect the narrative or how someone views um the paintings um then when i got to this piece um especially because it was so heavily influenced by um beatrice gonzalez the painting that uh, beatrice made um was a party scene and um it was a curtain piece that had had a repeat pattern of a party that was um, a kind of a mockery of the Colombian government at the time that they were all off having a party and the people of the country were in poverty. And um, so um, when I was making this piece, I knew that I wanted to have loads of figures in it so that you could really, that some could be obliterated by the folds and some you'd be able to see um, the faces are quite um, naive, naively painted or, you know, they're not portraits. I didn't want it to feel like it was a portrait on a, on a curtain with like loads of faces looking at you. But I did want you to think that each of the people were individuals. Um, I tried out, lots of different um images of crowds of people um like my friends at parties or uh people at an art opening and different things and it, the, the reason why i picked this uh image was because of the composition and how the young ballerinas all had the same uniform on because that kind of made them almost like merge into one person you know with the folds you one person could like their their clothes would maybe like merge into the next person that one person's leg could be the next person's and it kind of felt that way um then um it also was appropriate because i spent i was um from the age of five until the age of 19, I uh, attended ballet classes um, and had the opportunity to dance on stages like the one in the Solstice or in the National Concert Hall and things like that. And it hasn't, I haven't really thought about that very much until I started to make this, um, this painting of how, how that experience has affected my um career as an artist and i think being on the stage and uh being taught to kind of perform in front of people um has probably affected how i uh produce art because i produce art with this kind of idea that i'm like ta-da look what i've made what do you think um you know look look at this so that kind of came into the making of the curtain piece as well that you know i'm i want to make this big colorful yoke that doesn't fit in anyone's house that is just this big thing when you walk into the gallery that it, i wanted it to be like big and bold and that's why the colors are so like big and vibrant in it and it's a statement piece then really yeah. And yeah. it has a massive I have to say it's like it was created for the wall or the wall was created for it I, I, I'll turn my camera around I haven't planned on doing this just give me one sec because I am here can you see that <laughs> so I shouldn't have done that you all have to come in and have a look <laughs> but it, it, it like it's such an impact when people come in because we're, we're only open for takeaway coffee here 
and you can see them you know they're they're making a beeline for the for the counter and then they kind of stop and and see this massive piece on the wall and and it's great and it was it was even better made better because we kind of reopened and like that we made us you know we were relaunching reopening and you were making a statement with with the work so it was just it was a happy a happy collaboration i think even though probably didn't set out to be that um so yeah have you would you like to say any more about the work or um no i think i bla i blabbed on a lot i get <laughs> you get lost in I don't even know if it makes sense off the time people. No, it was perfect. It was perfect. So maybe while well, I'm going to unshare my screen and see if there are any questions there, maybe you could tell us what's next for, for Eileen O'Sullivan. Um, what are your plans? Or? Um, I'm currently working on, actually, which is kind of relevant uh, to this piece, I'm working on um, three paintings um, in collaboration with a dancer who is also based in Neath. Um, and um, she's going to create three dance pieces and I'm going to create three paintings and then we'll have um, we'll ha we, ha we have we um, have a composer on board as well um, to create music specifically for the themes that we're working with and some spoken word artists who are going to create um, some pieces so that's um, a new uh, collaboration that I'm working on, which is exciting. And uh, will that, sorry, will that be recorded, or will it be virtual, or will it be? Or are you going to look for a venue, or how is that going to be presented to the um, world? We're. I don't know yet. With, uh, coronavirus, we think we'll uh, do a video to put out on like social media, kind of that kind of platform. I don't know, hopefully we'll be able to have some kind of event or exhibition, but at the moment that's what we're planning because of restrictions. And um, as well, um, I'm in an, that exhibition that was supposed to go ahead um, back, God, when was that, last March, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, uh, that's gonna go ahead. That will be on Angel Street in Dublin um, in a shop that's just that's not used that has a uh, 10 Irish artists so that will be uh, a nice thing to be a part of yeah. and um I've got um um a piece in so far in art gallery in power sports center in Dublin uh, with uh Catherine in there she's in a great support uh shows includes me in shows there so that's great and um yeah a few other little bits in the pipeline um i feel like i shouldn't say about the other project that i'm working on because i'm not quite sure of the details i uh, to put well, that in the world no, that's not fair that'll bring us back to, to listen to eileen again <laughs> Thanks so much. I have a question here from another Deirdre. Um, how does Eileen know when the painting is finished? And it, it, like I said at the beginning, sorry, before you answer that, if anybody does have a question, I think now it's it's just 10 to 8. If you wanted to unmute and ask it, or you can pop it into the chat there and, and we'll take the next few minutes to, to talk. So how do you know when a painting is finished? Sometimes you have a an end goal that you're trying to get to other times you've like overloaded the canvas so much that it physically can't take any more paint and you're like right i guess it's finished now mm. deadlines are brilliant for helping you finish paintings because you physically have to get rid of them and then you're like okay i guess i'm finished it's like writing an essay with a deadline and you have to um you know you're like I, okay i guess i'm finished my assignment now because the deadline is here but um yeah so like it could i could be happy with a painting after a day or it could take me two years to get to a point where i am happy with the end result and I'll, and sometimes things can come back to the studio and i'll work over them again 
So I think it's finished. See it on display in an exhibition, bring it back to the studio and work over it again. So. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's a never ending process, really. Which yeah. Is exciting. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's nice when things leave the studio because it's like a child, you know, when you're, you're, uh, doing art with a child you have to like know when to whip the page from one of them before they like destroy it and mix all the colors into brown if I could have a person to do that for me that'd be great because oftentimes I look at photographs of paintings I've been making and I'm like oh it looks so much better before I did that layer but that's part of it that's that's the good thing about documenting it. I think through photography and and the same with the notebooks, they're, they're things you can refer back to again and again. And it's that learning, creative learning process. Um, I think is really important. And the, and just the fact that you're aware of that, you know, is something that will will you'll gain more and more of that insight. I suppose, yeah. you know, as as you as you continue with with your practice. Um, I have another question here from Marion. Um, Oh, I think so. The painting behind Deirdre looks great. I haven't seen it out of the studio. It's some transformation from when the bike and the pool were in it. I love it. So there's, <laughs> there's somebody who saw it before you covered your layers up. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have um, any other questions? As I said, you can pop them into the chat or you can unmute and, and ask them if you like. Um. I have a question that popped up on mine um, from Sylvia. It okay. says, uh, what medium do you use solvent wise? Do you, do you use liquid or turps and linseed, a la primer or over days um, drying? Um, so I generally use uh, turps. I use the, the citron like low odor turps and I use um, boiled linseed oil. So um, if it's the kind of the first layer of a painting, I'll generally use turps um, to water it down, almost like you're, you're using kind of like um, um, watercolors to have like a thin, um, a thin kind of chalky layer. Then if I'm building, up more layers um, I'll use the paint straight out of the tube so it's oilier so that sits better on top of that kind of chalky layer and then um, sometimes I'll use a um, wax medium to make thicker marks on the top of the on the top of the like if, it, if it's very thick and then depending on the on the painting and um, if i'm if i'm doing a la, a la prima i don't know how to say that word as in wet on wet i'll i'll often put all the colors out that i want to use on my palette and i have a bottle that's um half and half half linseed oil and half turps and i'll pour that into the paint and mix it so they have a consistency that's kind of like Mm. Um, maybe like all I can think of is like egg like that kind of uh, it's, it has a, a good bit of movement in it so then when you pick it up on your brush they can kind of like sloop around the canvas and mix into each other and like sit beside each other um, depends on what the photograph I'm looking at kind of demands like do I want it to be all done in one so that the colors sit into one another or do I want it to be like layers that are built up and um, give more of a depth over time and layers so it really depends on what way I want mm -hmm. the painting to Great. I have a question from Owen. Is final composition something you plan carefully before you start or do you rethink and recompose as you work? Definitely the rethink and recompose. I never know what I'm going to make and uh, I'll often say to my friend Emer, who's a 
artist as well like I don't know what I'm doing and she's like you never know what you're doing and how many paintings have you made I you know I never have an idea of what a painting is going to be before I start and that's I think that's why I like it because it surprises you as you go along um, it's part of the process yeah I think actually it might be great if, if you're allowed to, you know, the little, the, the short video for junior certificate. Do you oh. have the link? Could you put the link for that in the chat? Yeah. Uh, of course. People could take it down because I watched it the other day and it really explains that. Oh, and actually, if you wanted to look at that, uh, it explains it really well. Your, your process um, of, of rethinking and your recomposition of the work so if you could share that with everybody that would be brilliant so that's what that was a short video done by creative ireland i think was it um it was a uh, um the department of education junior cert teachers uh the art department so basically um the it's the resource that teachers in junior cert uh cycle would use uh, maybe they might like use it for themselves to get an idea of what they want to teach um, their students or sometimes they'll use that page as a resource for students to watch and um, the they did a 10 part series of 10 different creative jobs so there was like a goldsmith a videographer um, a dancer um, a wood turner all these different Mm. patience to give uh, students an insight into uh, different creative careers that you can aspire to um, so that's what the video is it's 10 minutes long and it just kind of shows different it shows my studio and different mm. bits that I will work from in that yeah it'll, it'll just put i think a lot of what you said into context tonight and then i, I love looking at other artist studios i'm very yeah. <laughs> what they're doing. So I, like, show me what I, would, I would recommend i must watch some of the others but i would recommend um that one especially uh, you know following on from this conversation i think it would be really nice. the fella who videoed it he said he normally videos come dine with me <laughs> <laughs> So he uh, normally goes over to England to shoot, but uh, he... He did a very good job. You would not have known that. I look at it very differently <laughs> now, I have to say. He is a very nice man. Yeah. Um, do we have any final question um, or questions there? Would anybody like to unmute and ask it or pop it up in the, in the chat before we finish up? I can't, so I can't see everybody's faces, so I'll have it. Do you have any more questions there, Eileen? No, I think that's it for me. Thanks so much for um, hosting and coming along. Pleasure. Can you just tell us just before just before we go about the Terps correspondence course? Because I hadn't heard of that since you spoke about and since you mentioned it before to me, uh, other people have come. Oh yeah, I'm I'm taking part on that as well. Would you like to mention that? Um, it's a course um, run in um, London. Um, basically a group of painters used to go to the pub and talk about painting together and they realized that there was no painting magazine that just talked about paint uh, that just talked about paint and painting it was always like this is Eileen she's from Ashburn and she likes dogs blah 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 and the painters were like we don't want to know any of the lifestyle background stuff. We just want to know about the painting. So they started making a magazine where they interviewed each other and shared their work. Um, it's called Terps Banana. And then they started doing like studio visits and helping each other out. And now it has kind of progressed into, um, they have an, an on-site uh, program where, you know, people have studios and they, they have painting mentors and um, but I take part in a program that's called the Terps Correspondence Course so what I do is I have they have a platform that you can upload your you upload your work to and then a paint a, another painter reviews your work and sends you feedback um, which has been if you do it like five times a year which is just uh, I find it quite helpful because it 
it's hard to get a feedback loop in the studio when you're in the studio on your own all the time. So having that outside um that outside perspective is helpful. Um Productive criticism we used to call it in our studio, yeah. Yeah. And and that peer to peer interaction and, and and correspondence I think is really, really important. And like that you said at the beginning that you were a people person. So, you know, just even what do you think of this or is is very very important it's kind of expensive but i justify it to myself because i know that it's another painter who's being paid to review my work so i think it's a nice way of kind of paying it forward or passing it on and then you get the benefit of someone else who has more experience than you as well yeah 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 well again thank you so much um it was just so nice to to have this conversation and like you said i think we've, you know we've all been so isolated um even though we probably have been a little bit some of us out and about a little bit more but i think we've all been suffering from a bit of of isolation and, and verbal isolation and that as well and um, so it was really really nice to to see and, and hear more um about your work as well so thank you thank you very much um, before we finish up, I'd just like to say that, um, as I said, Eileen's show is on here until Friday the 18th of June. And we are currently planning um, a very large show by contemporary Irish artist Isabel Nolan. And that will be opening here in the gallery on July 3rd. We are planning a face-to-face -face opening. Couldn't tell you whether that will happen or not, but we have to plan that and, and plan B, C, D, E, and F. Um, so if, like I said there in the chat, if you just keep an eye on our social media and our website and we, we're finalize, trying to finalise our summer programme, so we will have face-to-face -face events and um, we'll have stuff for Heritage Week again in August, like the Devonish Day um, and workshops for all age groups. We're going to do some BTS, some visual thinking strategies sessions in the gallery as well. So please do keep an eye on that. And like I said, try, if you can, try and come in and get a coffee and have a look at uh, Eileen's work while it is still up on the wall here. So yeah, so thank you all. You have a fantastic bank holiday weekend. The sun is still there um, and we'll see you all very soon. <laughs>